Okay, uh, good morning. My name is John Lynch. I'm a software developer with SideFX Software. Uh, and I'm going to speak about open BDB use in Houdini. So Houdini is a, a node-based procedural 3D modeling tool, uh, animation, and visual effects software. Uh, it's used a lot for very large-scale visual effects, um, so we're dealing with very large data sets. It has some built-in dynamic solvers for fluids and particles and all sorts of other things. Um, importantly, it's, it's had volume creation, simulation, rendering for, for several years, so it's sort of an ideal place for BDB to be integrated. So some of the projects I've worked on over the years, uh, today I'll be speaking mostly about the, the flip solver and the whitewater solver and a little bit about the, the grain solver. So OpenBDB was first introduced uh, into Houdini in 12.5. Uh, it was mostly an integration uh, release, so it was using a lot of the tools that the OpenBDB team had created and just making them work inside Houdini as sort of a first-class citizen. So adding support for our VEX scripting language to be able to access these VDBs, uh, rendering them with our, with our uh, mantra renderer. Uh, and most of the SOPs, the, the surface operators, the operators within Houdini, were from, directly from the OpenVDB team. So it was really mostly about just getting VDB into Houdini. Uh, and as Ken mentioned, the, the course slides from 2013 are mostly about, about that. So if you're interested to, to know more about that, you can look at those. So since then, we've developed some sort of higher level tools using OpenVDB uh, in some subsequent releases. We have some cloud modeling tools, uh, some grooming tools where we're actually sculpting velocity fields and then evecting curves through those uh, using the original geometry as a, as a SDF, as a collision SDF, to avoid interpenetration. Um, I won't be talking about those today, but those have been in the last couple of releases of, of Houdini. So I'm mostly going to be talking about uh, fluid and grain solvers. Um, these are things that are in Houdini 14 and in the upcoming Houdini 15, which will be released in October. Uh, there are VDB operations sort of throughout this workflow. And we use it, VDB both to source data for simulations. We use it to accelerate, uh, especially point lookup with this, the point index grid that Ken mentioned within the simulations. And then especially in Houdini 15, we're doing a lot of post-processing of the data that comes out to try to manage these very large data sets that we're creating. So the, the things I'm going to discuss briefly are, are using VDB for SDF collisions, uh, the accelerated point lookup using point index, um, compressing, this is actually a lossy compression, compression of the flipped data that, that comes out of the simulation, um, reseeding into very sparse volume. So, so we, we throw away a bunch of data when we compress the flip, sol, the flip in, uh, liquid um, simulation results. We need to be able to reseed into that for secondary effects like whitewater and stuff like that. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about surfacing. Jeff's got more on surfacing, so I might, I might skip through that pretty quickly. So for Houdini 14, we, we standardized on VDB as our, as our way of creating sign distance functions for collisions. So there's, a, there's a, particularly with deforming geometry, it's just VDB from polygons, which is the operation that we call it within Houdini, is just a very fast workhorse operation. We use it all the time. So if you've got a character that's deforming, it's walking through water, that sort of thing, we're running that through VDB from polygons to create a sign distance function that we can then use for collisions. And we use this both for... Um, like particle SDF collisions, uh, we might actually also use that to generate voxel weights that we use in a, in a sort of variational pressure solve that we do within the, with the flip liquid solver. Uh, and so you can see here, this is actually using the same collision object, this crag walking, which I'll actually show you some demos of later, uh, is being used both in the, the flip solver, so it's being used as, as those voxel weights, and it's also being used in the, the whitewater solver down here, where it's used as a much more traditional just particle against SDF collision. And then we also, also often reuse these sign distance functions downstream in the workflow to uh, maybe sep, uh, subtract out the collision object when we're doing surfacing or possibly activating particles that are near the surface during the simulation. So this is the point index grid that, that Ken was talking about earlier. We use this a lot um, for point lookup. So what, what you're seeing here is basically a, a sort of a 2D version of like what a VDB, VDB grid might look like. If we take all these points and we, we assign them to the voxels where they would be in space, then we can essentially, if we have this query point in the middle, the, the yellow point, um, we can very quickly say, okay, if we're looking for all the points within a, a radius around here, we can basically put a bounding box around that and find which voxels that bounding box touches. And these are all very fast, constant time operations that, like Ken was talking about. And then we just iterate over all those points and we can reject the ones that are outside the radius and then do interesting things with them. So it's a little greedy. You get more points than you might want from just inside the radius, but this is all so fast that it ends up still being a, kind of a big win. Uh, 
Uh, this is a gather operation that I think uh, Dan might talk about a little bit. So this is the flip solver. Uh, these are all nodes that are in that make up the flip solver. And I should say most of what I'm talking about today is uh, encapsulated in what we call digital assets. So you can actually open them up and look at all the nodes, look at all, all the operators. So when Houdini 15 is released in a couple months, if you download the free version, unlock it all, you can see most of this stuff in action. So the two main operations that we do using this point, this fast point lookup, is transferring velocities from the particles to a grid and creating a sign distance function from the particles that sort of represent the current state of the fluid. Uh, we use the velocity to solve for things like in incompressibility, and we use uh, the, the surface tracking to uh, handle things like collisions and the free surface boundary condition of basically where it transitions from fluid into, into air. So we did some benchmarking. We had a similar structure built on the Houdini native volumes, which have, it's basically like if you can imagine one layer of VDB where it, it has uh, tiles that are just 16 cubed, so 16 cubed voxels, and it just has one layer. So we had a very similar structure to the point index critics that based on ours. We, we put 93 million points into these sort of corners and transferred a, a vector at, attribute to a field, which is very, basically what we do when we do the velocity transfer and, and benchmark this. So this graph basically shows our data structure, which we thought was really nice, against BDB. And the very tall, bad graph is ours, and BDB is a very short one. Um, so the, the kind of interesting thing here is at about 220 million points, we're saving about uh, 30 seconds of frame almost, just in this operation. Um, it's common to do two steps, sub steps of frame, so this is like a minute of frame just in this operation by using by switching to point index grid, which we did for 14. And if you, this is a sparse operation. So if you imagine just collapsing all of those uh, those points into the middle of the of the grid, you get very similar behavior out of VDB. So if you kind of go back and forth, it doesn't. The difference between sparse and dense is not bad, which is which is really impressive. We, you know, ours gets better because we didn't, don't handle sparsity as well. So this is a big win for us. Um, so this is a grain solver. And we also use it, we exposed it in this PG find VEX function. So essentially we expose the same point index grid lookup into a function that we can call from our scripting language. So what it's doing here is it's basically looking at all the neighbors for each individual sand particle. This is, uh, I don't know how many million particles this is, but it's a lot. So this needs to be very fast. Uh, we're actually kind of interestingly doing the spatial lookup using VDB on the CPU and then we transfer all that neighbor information to the GPU and do a lot of constraint iterations on the GPU. Um, the, the sandbox, the sand here is actually created using a VDB based tool, I'll talk about a little bit later. And we're actually activating particles. So a lot of these particles start out asleep and then we activate them using some, some VDB based tools as well. So also new in uh, Houdini 15 is this idea of flip data compression. So our flip solver is being used in production to make very large simulations, hundreds of millions of particles, which creates a lot of data. Uh, it's expensive to store this data, it's expensive to load the data back in over the network, uh, and it's expensive to work with in the viewport. It's, it just takes a long time to view what these simulations actually look like. So we're, we're looking at ways to, to make that lighter weight and, and reduce that load on the artist and on, on the network and the disks. So the idea is to take this dense native simulation data that comes out of the solver and turn it into sparse data as a, as a lossy post process. And this is all VDB based. So basically we turn it into VDB data on the way out and that's what actually gets saved to disk and that artists work with downstream. So the primary simulation representation of a flip solver, a liquid solver like that, is the particles. So they're marker particles that show where the liquid is uh, and they also contain things like velocity, density, all sorts of other attributes that we might use in the liquid simulation. So the idea that we're going to use is we're going to keep just the topmost particles on the surface and use that for surface detail in the, in the downstream operations. We also have these, these secondary volumes that I was talking about earlier that we build with those, with those operators um, that represent the sign distance function, they represent the velocity field um, in a volumetric way. And these are often used, there's almost always safe to disk anyway because they're so useful for, for secondary elements like white water and stuff. So you can use it for depth testing. You can always say, you know, how deep within the water am I? Am I underwater? If so, you might apply a buoyancy force. We can uh, advect the particles around in the velocity field. So they're very useful. They're being saved anyway. So the idea is we're going to use them to sort of serve as a decompression uh, mechanism for this, this lossy compressed data. And so these are going to be saved as VDBs. So this is a very simple example. This is a very small example. This is about 11 million points, which is tiny by production standards. But it was easy to do examples on my laptop, so this is what it is. Um, the main things here is this is about 10 seconds of, of simulation data. It's 52 gigabytes on disk. And it plays back around a little over three seconds of frame. Uh, 
It's not too bad, but it's, just, it's not scrubbable. It's, you can't just sort of go through the operation really easily. So what we want to turn it into is this lossy compressed version. So these tiles that you see across the top are actually the, the result of that point partition or tool that, that uh, Ken was talking about. So we're, we're partitioning the, d the data into spatially, basically. We're throwing away, you can't probably tell, but everything below the, the surface level is actually a, a VDB. It's actually a surface VDB that came out of the simulation, eroded down. So eroded down below where the surface detail comes from. And then we're also storing the velocity field and sampling it to give this uh, visualization. So this gives us about a six time compression. We get down as low as, I mean, as high as 10 times compressions from this. And importantly, you can play back at about um, 300 milliseconds of frame. Th this view you can't, but I'll show you some that you can, which makes it scrubbable, which makes it much easier to work with. And it's, it's just easier on the network, easier on the disk. So this is what this particular operator looks like. For points we're calling by depth, as I, as I talked about, we're spatially partitioning all the points into 4K tiles. So we're using that point partitioner tool at a resolution so that each, each tile is about 4,000 points. Then we save those to disk as what we call a packed primitive. It's uh, basically one primitive that represents all of those points. When they're on disk, they're flagged as delay load, which basically means we don't load them back in off of disk until we actually need the, the, the point data. And for the volumes, we essentially convert them to the narrowest band VDB that we can. So we, we throw away a lot of the simulation data. We sort of, through advection and some other, some other hopefully clever techniques, realize we don't need anymore and turn it into uh, narrowband VDBs, and then we save it to disk as a 16-bit float, it turned, which is an option on the, the VDBs uh, within, well, it's just part of the library, uh, which is great because it turns out that downstream we don't actually need that level. We don't need a full 32-bit for things like convection and, and some of the uh, top, topology operations we're doing. So this is what the output of it looks like just by itself. This is, so we're not loading any points off of disk here. This is just those point partition or created tiles uh, and this is what will play back in about 300 milliseconds of frame. You're not getting the full uh, view of what the simulation looks like, but you can scrub through it and then switch to a different view if you want to actually see all of the data. So another interesting thing that we can use as a, as a preview is this is actually sending that, that narrowband surface S, uh, SDF through VDB's um, polygon meshing, adaptive polygon meshing. And it's uh, sampling from the velocity field to give this visualization to kind of show where speed is and that sort of thing. And this is all very fast. This is about 400 mill, well, relatively speaking, this is 400 milliseconds. So again, you can scrub through this and get a really good view of, of what the simulation looks like at a, at a high speed. Notice we're not late loading points here at all. Um, this is just loading those VDB volumes off disk. The other thing that we have in 15 is just distributed simulation. So we have simulation that can be sliced up and put across uh, different machines. Um, each one of these machines we call a slice, and uh, so there's the idea is that each um, particle and each voxel will actually know what its native slice was. So when we're saving these to disk, we basically need to throw, every, every, every node will know a little bit about all the slices around it, but it needs to throw away all the data that isn't in its slice, uh, and then compress it and save it to disk. When we load it back in, we basically need to combine all of those slices together to do all these surfacing operations and secondary operations, that sort of thing. So these, this is the network that does it, and essentially all it's doing is separating out a surface and velocity field, these, these VDBs, and then it's using the VDB combined nodes, which uh, in, in, in a mode called flatten all of B into A, which basically just means take, all, take this first reference surface SDF, for example, and do an SDF union, union all of the surfaces from all, the, from all this other input into the same thing. So this is how we do the merge using, the, using VDB. So this is just an example of a, of a distributed simulation um, showing the delay load. So this was originally about 120 million particles divided across four machines. So each one had about 30 million particles. Again, fairly small, but, it, but an interesting demo. The tiles here are all those point partitioner tiles. And down at the bottom, you can see we're only loading about 3 million points out of the original 120 million. So it just makes it easier to work with if you want to focus your secondary elements or, or focus on surfacing just in one area. It, it, it's just an easier... Um, way to work with this data in the viewport after, um, after the simulation. Uh, so the problem, of course, is all the effects artists out there are going, great, well, where are all my particles? I just I spent all this time simulating, and you just threw them all away. What if I want to have bubbles deep within my, within my fluid, and I want to have white water and churning around aeration down at the bottom? How do I get those back? So the idea is we're going to reseed points into that surface and sample that velocity field that we've saved out. But we have to do that in a very sparse way. We have to do that in a very sparse volume. So we created a new uh, a way of basically, um, I'm going to go through this part pretty quickly, but a way of creating um, 
a background VDB grid that's, that's essentially, because it's unbounded, it can just sort of be access aligned in space. And then we take our high res input SDF and copy the activation area onto that grid. And then we only, we, we can basically run VEX over those active voxels and generate new points. So this, this is what this kind of looks like. So if you take this high res grid that's coming in, you copy the activation area onto these background these background voxels, and you then basically we just generate points only within uh, the, the active voxels. And this is sort of pseudocode for what this looks like. And, and the reason we use a background grid is it gives us this sort of uh, fixed jitter space because you can use the, the voxel position as a seed, and it's, it's, it doesn't matter about rotation on the input or anything like that. Uh, and it also lets us control how much work we're doing per voxel. So if we want to create 8 or 16 points per voxel or 64 points per voxel, we can control it by the resolution of the background grid. Whoops, I just did something wrong. Okay, so why does this matter? Um, th th and so I need to briefly talk about uh, whitewater emission. So the way that that works is we take the flip particles as input, then we do a hard culling of everything, of, of basically anything that's too slow or not in the right depth. We just throw away all those particles, and then we do a sort of more sophisticated criteria where we will sample things like vorticity and acceleration of the, of the, against the simulation and map that to a probability that it will emit uh, whitewater particles. So this is that same simulation and it's mapping basically the velocity field to a zero to one fog volume. So the important thing here is you can see these little tiles and th these, are all, these are the active voxels. So what we can do is we can take this simulation and only seed points in these in these active areas, and then we send it through the regular white water emission criteria. So you're sort of getting back uh, these points that are going to be deep within the within the fluid, and um, and then we just simulate them as usual. So that's what this looks like. So this is not a simulation. This is just showing the emission uh, of the white water. So all the purple here is actually what we're doing, what we're getting from reseeding with this sparse technique. Um, so this is an example where this actually matters. This previous example is small enough it didn't really matter. This is about 80 million particles. It's got these little pockets of white water. It's, it's coming down a hill. It would be, it's not access aligned in any way. It's very sparse. So the areas where we need to reseed are, are these little pockets around. So we need to really, um, we need a fast way to handle something big like this. Uh, why not just use the regular VDB scatter operations? We have some sort of interesting requirements for scattering um, or for generating points within volumes. This is, for example, a tetrahedral packing that we use for sand. Um, using VEX, we got to, I, I hope you can see this, there's these ridge artifacts that if you, if you use a tetrahedral packing and then just do SDF rejection, you get these kind of ridge artifacts. So but the fact that we did it in VEX, we could very quickly add this dithering, dithering operator where we basically just made the uh, SDF test probabilistic. So this is still tetrahedral. It's still packed, but it looks kind of random, but it still has a sort of low energy configuration, which becomes important when we do activation. So this is, all those particles were asleep. We are using PG fine to look up um, that, the point index grid based fine to look at near fast moving particles. Uh, they wake up the particles. They're already in this tetrahedral configuration that's, that's fa fairly low uh, energy. And you can also see we're using the, the VDB dilate operations to pull in the collision SDF that I talked about earlier, and that's how we're activating the particles near the, uh, near the collision uh, object here. And then we're also using VDB from polygons to uh, generate a, the shape of the castle. And right before it gets hit, it activates the castle all at once, just sort of as an artistic thing so that it doesn't move before then. So I'm going to talk about surfacing very quickly. The most important thing for us for surfacing um, is dealing with the compressed input. So uh, we basically want to have a high level, a high le higher level surfacing asset than we've had in the past that has a lot of this interesting VDB-based workflow. The liquid in the crudes paper, that I, I think Jeff's going to talk a lot about what, what um, a lot of these techniques, and, and so we're, we were inspired by a lot of that. So the, the main thing that we do, we, we need to do, is we have this very thin particle layer. So we, using either VDB from particles or, or our internal VDB from particle fluid, just sort of depending on how you want to start, we'll create an SDF from just those upper layer particles. Then we'll take that surface SDF, that VDB that we've, that we've compressed from the simulation, use a, a, an erode operation, a VDB erode operation, to erode away everywhere that there are particles, and then do an SDF union to basically get it so that they all match up together. So the, the depth comes from the VDB that was saved out from the, that, simula uh, that compression process. Uh, 
Uh, this is just creating, using some VDB analysis and some other tools to create a, a spatially varying mask to where we're going to apply some smoothing and some other operations. Um, so this, this is, kind of, I don't know if you can really tell, but this is the result of smoothing, of doing that smoothing in a spatially varying way. Um, we subtract the SDF collisions here. Like I, so this is pulling in those SDF collisions that I was talking about earlier and, and removing them from the surface using an SDF uh, operation. Uh, we do some adaptive meshing. Um, it's probably easier to see here, so all the details down where the, where the splashy stuff is happening and it's, it's very flat where it isn't. Uh, this is the mask just, just um, in action, and you can, see the, you can sort of see the adaptive meshing here. And this is, that, this is the sort of final full surface here. And so you get this very smooth surface down at the end and a lot of detail where, where the splash is going on. So this is that 120 million particle simulation spliced together. These are all the VDBs that have been spliced together. They've been unioned together. The particles are creating that particle surface. And you can, you can sort of see it's just colored by slice here. And the final result, um, you can sort of see that very smooth, almost mirror-like surface down at the end, which is we get from that spatially varying mask that, uh, and, and all the VDB operations. And that's all I have. Thank you.